We're back with five guys and a Bible, and we know it's been a while, and we know that you have just missed us immensely since the last time we had the chance to put a video out. We know because you've just been hounding us wanting to know, when's the next one coming out? I know. That's right. We love you. We, we love you very much. Uh, so here's now. Now's the time for the next one. Um, <laughs> Jason's got nobody beside of him, so I guess he's pointing at himself. So, um, and uh, so anyway, here we go. Uh, the topic tonight is is one. It's difficult. It's one of the most trying that I've I've come across. And uh, this was asked by uh, by one of you, and uh, basically the question went as. Uh, one of our viewers, neighbor, just moved in, and they were Jehovah's Witnesses, and he was desiring uh, any knowledge, any proof that we could share on how to witness to a Jehovah's Witness. Um, so we're going to, we've all been faced with that here, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we got a couple stories, and uh, um Mark's going to read a poem at the end, I think. So, um, all right. So, we're going to start off with Todd Bryant. So, Todd, mm -hmm. take it away. Mark said he was going to read that Robert Frost, two, you know, roads diverged in a wood. And I, I really haven't figured out what relevance that has, but I'm sure he'll tell us, you know, how that works out. Um, really, this is, this is a hard subject because almost everybody listening is going to be approached by Jehovah's Witness at some time. They really completely outdo us missionary-wise. I mean, they are out there, and they are putting out their message. I've been approached uh, two times really boldly and, and a couple of other times indirectly, but I just want to tell you about one particular experience that I had and why it can be confusing to somebody who doesn't know a lot, you know, which is which is – Somewhat common, unfortunately, in today's Christian circles. But this guy hit me up, and I don't know what he had been listening to. He'd probably been listening to a, a, a preaching session or something, and he, he was really worked up. And he hit me up immediately and asked me if, uh, if I was a sinner. And, you know, I immediately – I really thought he's probably just a Christian witnessing to me at first because he – actually went to where he was. He didn't come to me dressed up or anything. And I said, well, sure, I'm a sinner. And and he immediately said, oh, man, you're you're really in for it. You know, you're in for it. And um, I said, why is that? And he said, well, the end of the world's coming. You know, God's going to judge. And I said, well, that's true. You know, I, I agree with that. There's going to be a judgment. Uh, he wasn't real in-depth about his prophetic position. but And he said, well, all sinners are going to go to hell. You know, and or are going to be in trouble, I think is what he said. He didn't say they're going to hell. He said all sinners are going to be in trouble because they don't believe in, in hell. But anyway, I said, well, that's, are you not a sinner? And he said, oh, no. No, I'm not. By the way, now, I'm not condemning uh, the, the use of tobacco as a sin necessarily. We can, we can deal with that on another video. But he was smoking the whole time he was talking to me, the entire time. And um, which just rubbed me a little bit wrong. But. I said, you're not a sinner? And he said, oh, no, I'm not a sinner. And I said, you've never been a sinner? He said, well, I was a sinner one time, but I quit sinning several years ago. And he had a, a New World Translation in front of him, which is their Bible, and I think Jason's going to talk about that a little bit here in a second. But it's different. Everything doesn't read the same. But I said, let me, let me borrow that. And I just quickly turned over to 1 John 1 and 8. Uh, which says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I have never seen a guy that was so willing to turn off the faucet and walk off and not talk to me anymore. I, I mean, one verse, and he was done. You know, because out of his own Bible, which read the same way, he was condemned, and he knew it, and he was defeated. So he, he had been instructed enough to know a little bit, but he hadn't been instructed enough to face who he didn't know was a pastor. <laughs> you know, at the time, he thought he just met up with some guy. But God, I think in his sovereignty, led me to that guy. And I pray. I told him about Jesus, and I prayed for him. Of course, he didn't believe Jesus was God, and he didn't believe in the Trinity, and we went through some things about that. But um, I, I 
when I left, I prayed for that man that day. And I, I don't know what became of him, but I know he heard the gospel. And uh, uh, I just prayed that the Lord used it. So anyway, my point is you need, you do need to be prepared if you go to them because they're well-schooled in their doctrine. You know, that's all I have. All right, we're going to leave it up to Troy McGahan now. Well, um, it's just like the same as uh, what Todd has gone through. When I was starting off in the ministry, I had um, I was in a place called Hico, West Virginia. It was a little place in between um, Beckley and Somerville, West Virginia, and the church I was, we were starting was called Landmark Baptist Church. Literally two doors down from the church was the Kingdom Hall. And so they would, I would stand out there every morning on Sunday mornings. They'd pass by. I'd wave, you know, try to be friendly. Um, they weren't so much. But anyway, I would go down there and knock on doors to the community and put tracks in the door from time to time at the hall. But one day I was out with a pastor that we were doing. He was preaching revival for me, uh, Garner Smith. Some may know him on here. And we went to this one house and knocked on the door. And this lady came to the door, and we told her who we were, where we were from, and wanted to invite her out to our services. And she said, oh, no, no, I'll not be there. She said, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I said, really? And and all I can say is the Lord is the one who really put these thoughts in my mind. And I just asked her point blank. I said, can you tell me why you're Jehovah's Witness? I've never had anyone to tell me that. And she looked at me and said, well, you know, I don't really know. But let's go in here and I'll, we'll talk to my mother in law about it. So we went in there. We started talking. And the more we got to talking, the more interesting it became, and they would always talk about how that Jesus was, he was not God, but that he was a good man, and how, and, and so on. And I said, well, ma'am, I said, this is what I want to give you, and I want you to think about. I said, did Jesus cry? Who started your church? She said, well, Taze Russell did. I said, ma'am, I said, upon your premise right there, I'm going to prove to you that either Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and is perfect and sinless as who he says he is, or he is a lying scoundrel. I said, based upon what you just said, it, it can't be one, it can't be both ways. And so I read to her from Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> yes, Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus Christ talking about himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I said, now, ma'am, I said, for time's sake, I'm not going to continue on with with the rest of the scripture, but I want you to think about this. Jesus said that he is the rock, that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Taze Russell said that the church went out of existence, and he was here, and I'm summarizing it very succinctly, that he was there to restart it. I said, so it's one of two ways. Jesus is a lying scoundrel, or he's God, or Taze Russell is a lying scoundrel. Now, who are you going to take the word? Because she had even said that Jesus was the Savior. And, you know, the lady didn't have a whole lot to say, and very soon thereafter, we were invited to leave the house. So this is what I would say. If you're going to witness to Jehovah's Witness, you've got to get them off script, and you've got to get them in the Word of God. Don't leave the Word of God. Stay on it. And make them think, because if you don't, then you're going to play into their game. That's all I've got. All right, I'm going to take it from here. Uh, you know, I, I'm probably more affected by this question than maybe some of the other guys. And the reason being, 
is because I married a Jehovah's Witness. So, uh, or at least she had been a practicing Jehovah's Witness majority of her life. I married her when she was 21. She was pretty well practicing until she was a teenager, and uh, she kind of fell away a little bit. But she still had those belief structures. Uh, still didn't believe in the Trinity, still didn't believe in uh, many of the truths that we just told dear. And uh, her family was Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, at, at that point in my life, I wasn't a very strong Christian, wasn't uh, very well schooled in many things, but I, I can remember even the wedding ceremony itself was was had to be full of accommodations so that we didn't offend anyone. Uh, the way that, uh, you know, we might word certain things or certain prayers, you know, even the wedding march itself, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in that. So we, we came down to a different song. So I've uh, been affected by it for a long period of time. And, and the two brothers have, have mentioned something already that is, is pretty important. Whenever you are going to witness to a practicing Jehovah's Witness, you need to be prepared. Because if you don't, you're going to walk away with your tail between your legs. Because when you go to church and you listen to a sermon and you walk out and, uh, you know, just kind of go about your normal routine, but when they go to church, they have a time period in which they are being instructed in role-playing. And they're sitting there in a hot seat going through the same kind of questions that we would ask. And they're expected to give a response. So they are very well schooled at coming up with answers towards certain questions and trying to put you at, uh, so to say, defense right away. And, of course, one they always go towards is looking at the uh, deity of Jesus Christ. That is always one that they, they hammer on right away. And by the way, one of the uh, things that they'll they'll do is if you get into discussions with them, like I, I went through some training, like they, they came to the house and we went through some of those discussions for quite some time and until they were finally tired of me, I think. But, um, you know, They'll get. They'll. They'll. They'll do this. They'll say, "Well, let's just forget about Christ. Let's talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit." And if they can cast some doubt on that one, then they'll start to cast doubt on Jesus Christ. So they have a whole way of doing things, a whole order of doing ways, doing things. And like Troy said, you know, it's very well scripted. It's very well played out. They know exactly what they're going to do ahead of time. They want to keep you on a certain program, go through certain books, publications. Uh, that the Watchtower puts out. So you have to know. You have to know ahead of time what they believe. And if you're going to talk to them, you have to talk to them from their own literature. Because to them, the Watchtower Society is the equivalent of the Catholic Pope. They are the ones in control. They, the, as in their literature... You know, that they put out, they will tell you that God gave the word to the apostles so that they could instruct, and therefore the watchtower is now giving them the word uh, to instruct the people and that the people shouldn't be trying to interpret, to interpret the word of God by themselves. They are to go through the watchtower publications. Uh, so all they ever read is watchtower propaganda, basically. So that's. Kind of, but you've got to go to their literature. You've got to use their translation of the Bible. You've got to do all that. In, otherwise, they're going to turn you off because to them, that is the source of knowledge to go towards. And anything that you have is flawed. It is flawed. So I would recommend a couple books. Uh, one is called uh, Crisis of Conscious. It is written by a man by the name of Raymond Franz. Now, Raymond Franz was a member on, of the Watchtower Society. He was a high member of it. When he left the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, it caused a huge stir. 
because uh, his his uncle was one of the primary uh, contributors to the whole organization. It kind of focused around him uh, as, as one of the earliest earliest people. So uh, when he left, um, it caused a big stir. But he he goes through in this book and he points out uh, different changes that the Watchtower has made over a long time period. So you'll you'll see that uh, one time they said this, and then a few years later they said this. You know, whether it be talking about the coming of Christ and how he came invisibly. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of, of different things that they've said, they've recanted on, uh, predicting the end of the world a couple different times, and uh, predicting the dates for those, and that hasn't turned out right. Um, you know, I always say, go back, back in the Old Testament, God told them if they were to look at a prophet, and by the way, that's what they consider the Watchtower Society to be, is a prophet. If he was wrong, then don't listen to them. You know, just so that ought to be a red flag right there uh, when you call yourself a prophet and you're wrong on multiple occasions. Um, but at any rate, he followed up with another book several years later called uh, uh, In Search of Christian Freedom. And um, that's another good book. It's a, it's a much thicker book. It uh, has a lot of examples in it. But if you're really deeply concerned about witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness, you need to, to look at some of these books to understand what they believe, why they believe it, because the only way that you're ever going to make an effect in witnessing them is to understand what they believe, why they believe it, and then show them the error from their own literature. You have to do that. You have to show the doubt to the watchtower. You have to show them how their own Bible translation contradicts the things that the watchtower says. So uh, do I like their Bible? No, I don't like their Bible. Would I rather open up, you know, something else? Absolutely. Uh, but if you're going to talk to them, you're going to have to go to their translation or they're just not going to believe you. So Jason Schultz is going to take it from here, and he's going to talk about some of these things in their Bible, I believe. So I'm going to let you take it from here, Jason. Well, we're all, we're all telling personal stories, so I might as well start with that. I, I worked really closely with uh, Jehovah's Witness and had at, at work sort of continual conversations with them. I should point out it wasn't work here while I'm working at the church. It was a print shop that I worked at at the time. But one of the things that seemed to be a difficulty is the idea that the Son of God could be God himself. And so his son actually worked with us. He would point over to son and say, see, that's my son. So by definition, he's not me, right? And, and that seems logical. I tried as best as I could to explain it's a statement about the, the character, the essential nature of Jesus is being God. You know, being the Son of God makes Jesus equally divine, not something less. And if that's not how it works, then my friend had to admit that while he's human, his son could be something less than human. And of course, he would never, you know, admit to that. Well, Jesus being the son of God is God. You know, I have a real compassion for Jehovah's Witness people because they're, they're earnest and I know that they've been indoctrinated by the, the hierarchy that's existed before they got there. And I, I don't have much compassion for the hierarchy because I've looked through the Watchtower materials, and they absolutely know that they're taking things out of context, especially when they're quoting early church fathers and absolutely intentionally misquote them or take things out of context. They know that they're doing it. There's no way that they don't. So I, I don't have respect for that. but. I think some issues could be cleared up through a comparison, especially when, you know, we, we can't take every part of Jehovah's Witness doctrine and address it in this video, right? But to me, the most important one is recognizing who Jesus is, right? And so part of that can be cleared up by looking at God's glory as it's revealed in Isaiah and then in the Gospel of John. And like, like these guys said, I am going to use the New World Translation. I'm saying this is a disclaimer. It is not a good translation. But I'm willing to use it in this case to try to appeal to the honesty of those people who accept that as truth, 
then let's look at what it says. Because the way Jehovah is revealed in Isaiah and the way Jesus is revealed in John's gospel makes some things clear because both of the writers are very concerned about the glory of God. Okay, so here's here's a couple of passages for you. Again, it's from the New World Translation. I apologize for the people that offends, but uh, Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am Jehovah, that is my name. I give my glory to no one else, nor my praise to graven images, right? Um, Isaiah 48, verse 11 says, for my own sake, and it's Jehovah speaking, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how could I let myself be profaned? I give my glory to no one else, right? So Isaiah shows that Jehovah will not share his glory. He will not glorify anyone but himself. But listen to what the Gospel of John reveals about Jesus. John 1, 14. So the word became flesh and resided among us, and we had a view of his glory, a glory such as belongs to the only begotten Son from the Father, and he was full of divine favor and truth. Um, John chapter 8, verse 54, Jesus answered and said, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, the one who you say is your God. So Jehovah who will glorify no one but himself, glorifies Jesus. And that wasn't some late decision. That wasn't some one-time thing. Jesus always existed as the glory of God. Um, In his prayer in John 17, verse 5, Jesus says, So now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory that I had alongside you before the world was. In fact, a, a, a quick comparison of my, my favorite is there is one specific scene that Isaiah and John both talk about. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, Isaiah is talking about when he was called to be a prophet. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Jehovah sitting on a lofty and elevated throne, and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Okay? Isaiah saw Jehovah. You go forward to John chapter 12 which is talking about that specific event, and it shows it as a revelation of Jesus. As a matter of fact, verse 41 says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Now, unfortunately, those verses create a dilemma for the doctrine of of a Jehovah's Witness. If Jehovah's Witness doctrine is right, and Jesus is not God, he's just an angel, Then either Jehovah was lying in Isaiah or Jesus is lying in the Gospel of John. They can't both be true. On the other hand, if we accept Scripture as true, then Jehovah and and Jesus are the same because Jehovah is Jesus. If you want to honor Jehovah for who he is, if you want to witness for him, then you need to see how he's revealed through Jesus and In in fact, 1 John 3.23 says, Jehovah commands that we have faith in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. So just in case there's any Jehovah's Witnesses watching, I hope you are. I encourage you to honor Jehovah today by trusting in his son, Jesus Christ, for salvation from your sins. None of the things that the Kingdom Hall folks are telling you you can do in order to earn righteousness will ever earn you righteousness. The only way to be righteous is through faith in Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of those who believe in him. Okay? Um, wish we could talk about all the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine and really delve into it more, but that will have to suffice for tonight. I have one more verse I want to add, uh, speaking from the New World Translation again. This is Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse number 6, speaking about the birth of Christ. And again, it says, For there has been a child born to us, there has been a son given to us, and the princely rule will come to be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That's at capital M, capital G, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So there, from Isaiah, we see 
Jesus Christ being called mighty God. And if you look over in Isaiah 10, 21, you'll see again the reference to Christ as being mighty God. So even from their translation, we see indeed Christ is equated with God the Father. So Mark Campbell, Mark, we'll let you finish things up here. I'm going to apologize. You're going to hear my dog bark in the background. There's a couple of coon, ha- coon hounds on the hill behind it. When they bark, he barks. I apologize if you hear the dog in the background. I can't do anything about it. Sorry. Um, anyway, so the question is, how do you witness to Jehovah's Witnesses? And I appreciate all the things the guys have said. And One thing that I have noticed in my dealings with them is much like Todd said um, in his story, he proved a point to them. They turned around and they walked away. Troy, I think, said kind of the same thing. They proved a point to them. They turned around and walked away. They're not going to listen. Um, so what should we do? Well, you know, Paul, when he was talking to them on Mars Hill, you know, he used some of their own literature because he said um, certain of also of your own poets have said, for we are also – uh, his offspring. So he used some of their own writings to, you know, explain his point. Um, but then he went right into um, talking about the resurrection of the dead and, and talking about the resurrection of the dead and, and, and all of those things. Here, here's my point. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. Uh, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation for everyone that believeth to the Jew person and also to the Greek. Listen, you just got to give them the gospel. Th- they may not listen to you. They, they're probably not going to listen when you prove their watchtower is wrong. They, they're so deeply indoctrinated that they don't want to hear it when you tell them that they're wrong. You can prove to them that they're wrong, which we probably should do. But listen, we got to use the gospel, and and, and I, everybody knows that, I know. Um, but it is the Holy Spirit who takes the word and makes it effective in someone's life, and the Holy Spirit changes a hardened heart and opens it, makes it alive, makes it able to receive the word, and they're able to receive the word, and they're saved by the preaching of the gospel. Listen, if all you do is share the gospel with them, you're not going wrong. You can never go wrong by sharing the gospel. And so can you convince the gainsayers? I don't know if you can or not, but you can never go wrong by sharing with them the gospel. And here's the other thing, doing it in a loving manner, not having a hateful uh, spirit about you, but having a love in your heart and compassion for them and a desire to share with them the truth. And then the Holy Spirit can take that and make it effective in their life. So, so I would say witness to a Jehovah's Witness by sharing the gospel with them because it is the power of God into salvation. And live the light before them and, you know, and then let, let the Lord do his work. And uh, that's all we can do. And um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say. I'm sure the other guys have some other things to add. They're much wiser than I, and I will be quiet and listen. Uh, I think that was well said, Mark. Uh, never leave off without the gospel being given. And that doesn't matter who you're talking to, right? It doesn't matter if you're Jehovah's Witness, Muslim, uh, whatever you might be, give them the gospel. Does anyone have anything they want to add before we close this one out? Certainly it was a good question. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best of luck in in trying to uh, talk. Uh, don't expect it's going to be something that happens right away. Uh, it is something you typically have to build on quite a bit in order to uh, just keep on watering, keep on watering, uh, and little bit by little bit. So we wish you the best of luck with it. For now, though, we're going to tell you good night, good morning, whatever it is, but we're going to tell you goodbye. So. Thank you for watching. Do like us on Facebook. Uh, send us your questions, uh, uh, fiveguysinabible.com, or uh, you can submit them to us on Facebook as well. We'd love to have them. Again, 
uh, that's what we depend on to uh, get us through another episode is your questions. So send them in. So with that, good night and God bless. See ya. Good night, everybody.